The following sermon is by Manny Alaniz, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel in Northwest San Antonio, Texas. For more information, for prayer, or to support us financially, please visit our website at ststephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. On October 2001, in a Caribbean country of Haiti, a group of 17 church missionaries, 17 church missionaries, 16 from the U.S. and one from Canada, were visiting an orphanage in a suburb, in a suburb outside of the capital of Haiti, Port-au-Prince. Port well, during this visit, a notorious, violent, powerful gang, criminal gang, took these missionaries as hostage, took these missionaries captive, and held them for ransom. They wanted $1 million per each person, $17 million total. Now understand that these missionaries were from a small church. They were sent from a, from a ministry in the Ohio area. And these band of hoodlums were demanding $1 million per person or else the hostages would be executed. This group that had taken uh, these missionaries hostage. This, these missionaries were, were, were missionaries that were out there in the world serving the Lord. Uh, among those taken hostage, among those 17 taken hostage, there were five men, seven women, and five children. The children ranged from ages eight months to three years old, six years old, 13 and 15 years of age. The group of missionaries that were out there serving the Lord in Hades were involved in many different types of projects. They had been there before. They had gone and come back several times. And they were involved in projects like rebuilding projects, especially homes that were recently destroyed in an earthquake back in August of 2001. Before the kidnapping, this group of missionaries were involved in supporting thousands of children, distributing Bibles and Christian literature, as well as supplying medicine to clinics and teaching and helping teach pastors from Haiti and providing food for the elderly and others who were very vulnerable. Some of us here have either served as a missionary to another country or may know someone who served, who has served as a missionary to another country. When, when you are sent on a mission uh, trip to another country, either for a short time or a longer period of time, most of the time, good missionary a good missionary group would, would have been trained in the, in the language, the culture, and the customs of the country that they're going to serve in. They're made aware of the possible danger that exists in these countries, especially a country like Haiti, a Haiti where, where at best that government is unstable. At best, it's unstable. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how you would feel if you were a missionary, one of those missionaries taken hostage in a country such as Haiti? How would you feel? And truly, you would feel, you would have a sense of desperation, and, and you may even feel a, a sense of hopelessness. Hopelessness, because there's no organized Law enforcement, there is, but it's, it's at best unstable. And 
best if you were one of those missionaries, you would feel hopeless. Ah, but what if? What if you at this moment were being held hostage and didn't know it? What if you were being held hostage, bound to an eternal wickedness that cost you your life and didn't know it? What if you were enslaved as a hostage, destined for eternal damnation? to a place, a gruesome place, and didn't know it. What if? What if you were confined as a hostage to a horrific place that is dominated and ruled by a strong man whispers in your ears to try to gain control of you, to try to make you do the things that he wants you to do, who, who tries to take over even your country and lead it in a direction of damnation. What if that was what was going on in your life at this moment and you didn't know it? That's what the Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was telling the religious leaders who were against him, who were trying to kill him, who did not believe the things he was telling them. Christ says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now we're getting closer to home. Now we're getting to this, what if? What if you were captive and didn't know it? Many of us, for years, were captive, held in bondage to sin, and didn't know it, didn't realize it. Those who our Lord was speaking to, the religious leaders, were in bondage to sin. They did not believe what Christ was telling them, and they were doomed, doomed. They were captive and doomed and didn't. No, they didn't realize that their eternal destiny was in hell. They were not aware, didn't know it, and didn't believe it. That's what happens when we're sharing the gospel, right? And we're telling them that we're broken, there's something wrong with us, that our destiny is where you don't want to go. Don't know it. Don't believe it. The same thing. The same thing can be said about everyone prior to their faith in Christ. All of us, prior to our faith in Christ, prior to us receiving Christ, were captive. We're being held captive. And a ransom was demanded, was demanded of us. We all practice sin. Because we were slaves to sin. That means that we all sinned because we were sinners, not the other way around. And as Jesus says, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. If you sinned at all prior to faith in Christ, if you committed any sin, and we did, many, multiple, I lost count. That means you were a slave to sin, and your destiny was sealed except for Christ, except for him. We are all held captive to sin that leads to eternal death, to be freed, to atone for our bondage to sin. A ransom has been demanded. And for all who are in Christ, a ransom, yes, a king's ransom has been paid. For all of you who, have, who are in Christ, who have received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, as Macy and Mary did today, a king's ransom was paid. Jesus Christ paid a king's ransom to, to atone for the eternal lives of everyone who believes in him. Today marks the fourth Sunday 
of this season of Lent. This is a season of remembrance. It's a season of celebration, a celebration of the life, work, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The focus of our, of our passage, of our text, is in um, verse 45, where it stands written, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, a ransom for many. Take a moment, okay? Because we're if you're I want you to get what, what is going on here. You're we're being told by God's word that we're all sinners and we're destined, we're destined to eternal damnation. And a ransom, it's going to take a, a king's ransom to get you out of where you're going. That's what we're being told. And Jesus says that he came to lay his life down, to give his life as that ransom, a ransom for many. And we pray that you are a part of that many. And how do you know if you are a part of that many? You receive Christ, a Savior. And see, look, those aren't just bywords. You know, it's not like an incantation. Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Right before I die, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. That, that's a get out of hell, get out of the fires of hell card. Does it? Is that what some people say? I'm going to live my life the way I want to, to do the bad things I want to, to think the way I want to, to never worship him. And right before I die, I'm going to pull out out of my back pocket, get out of the get out of hell card. For I say, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, that is nonsense. It is, it's a reality. To receive Christ is a reality. It's a conversion of life. It is a rebirth. It is being born of the Spirit, born from above. You can have all this vast knowledge of Holy Scripture like Nicodemus did when he came to visit Jesus, and Jesus tells them, you cannot even see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. I don't have to believe that, Manny. Do I? I you know, that's what Scripture says. I, and I'm just repeating what Scripture says. Do you have to believe it? Well, I would pray that you would believe that, because that's what God demands. That's what he demands. As we look at our passage, as we look at our text, it's interesting that the word ransom used by our Lord denotes, it denotes a predestination. It denotes a predestination. It is a thing or a person, the, the thing or the person being sought. It indicates that that thing or that person, the person being sought, is a hostage that belongs to someone else. The person being sought is a hostage who belongs to someone else, who belongs to Christ. So then the critical issue of our text is atonement, is atonement, God's atonement. As we look at our passage, we see three things, three questions that pop up really quick. It is, what is paid? The second question, to whom is it paid? And the third question, why was this king's ransom paid. So let's start with the first question. The first question is, what is paid? What is paid? Listen, I know you, many of you, and I know that if one of your loved ones was taken hostage in a life and death situation and a ransom was demanded of you, that you would give everything you got. Yeah, everything you had in your checkbook, your house, your everything, it didn't matter. You want, you would give everything up to pay that ransom, to save a loved one. Would you not? But yes, of course you would. But what if you got a response and you were told, that's not enough. That is not, that's not even near enough to free your loved one. I know all of you, in the, ones, the ones I know, you, those of you who I know personally, I know that you would be willing to exchange your life for that one of your loved ones who's being held captive, 
You would be saying, you would, you, I know you would say, hey, listen, take me, take, take me, and, and, and let me, give me back that person, and, and take me as hostage. Would you not? Would you not? Of course you would. But here's the bad news. The bad news is that that's it's not enough. It's not enough. What you have, your life even, is not enough. See, Psalm 49, the, the Word of God in Psalm 49, verses 7 and 8, establishes a, a dilemma for humans, for us. It says, truly, no man or woman can ransom another or give to God the price of his or her life for the ransom of their life is costly and cannot suffice. The ransom even of your own life can, does not suffice a, a ransom for anyone else, e even yourself, even yourself. It does not suffice. It is not enough. The human condition, the, the condition of humanity since the fall is one of bondage to sin. It is corrupt. It has been corrupt because of death. See, when sin came into the world, death came into the world, corruption started, and everything became corrupt. That's what's been going on. Because we have disobeyed God, we have revolted from his good order and holy decrees. And thereby, we are slaves to death, and children of wrath by the word of God, by the word of God. This is like too much, man. It's too much. Get off the subject. Get off the subject. But that's what the subject's about. Because what, what a passage like the one today is trying to do is trying to get your attention. That what you, the world you, 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 the world you live in, the environment that you live in it, it is too small. It belongs to, it, to a bigger environment. And that there are problems. There's something wrong with you, with the world. And we know that because of the violence, because of death, babies die. We know there's something wrong. We know this is not heaven. We know that. So we're going to try even harder to do the best, to live the best life we can today. That's not good enough. And we're being told that even in the word of God, we cannot, that we cannot ransom ourselves. The psalmist is effectively telling us that no person can rescue him or herself. Nor can we rescue anybody else. Why not? Well, because we cannot muster the moral currency needed to pay that ransom. We ain't got it. We don't have it. We're corrupt. According to the Bible, we are tainted with sin. Well, I'm talking about a man. I just came to see Macy and Mary do the make a professional faith, or to see if we can make a reaffirmation of faith. I didn't come for all this. It's the reality we live in. Ah, oh, but we'd rather listen to to the news and how horrible the news is. Maybe we'll live in that reality. The reality of life and death in the kingdom of God is real. The joy, the joy is also real. The joy of our Savior, the joy of God, the joy that God brings is beyond our comprehension. And we need to, we need to realize that, that we are tainted with sin, that sin we were we were even we were even sinners when we were conceived. We were conceived in sin. We are from a heritage of sinners, a legacy of sinners. My dad is a sinner. My grandpa was a sinner. My great grandpa goes on and on. It seems hopeless, doesn't it? And it is hopeless without Christ. The problem that is going on is that because it was a human who sinned against God, 
Here's a problem. It's going to take a human to pay the price. Ooh, now we got a big problem. We have a problem because there's not a human. We just I just talked about it. The Bible tells us there's not a human who is who is not tainted. We all fall short of the glory of God. So how can any human pay the price? But it requires a human to pay the price because the penalty was com against God was committed by a human. How could this be? How can we be saved? Hence, hence the need for a God man. Hence the need for God's grace who gave us his son because he loves us. He gave us his son. Can you imagine a love like that? When you're down, when you're depressed about what's going on in your life, and because things can be very depressing, think about the love of Christ. Think about the love of God and the love that he expressed by giving us his savior. This is real stuff that cannot be imagined. I just want to go on with my life, Manny. I got to work tomorrow. Yeah, you got to work tomorrow. You're going to, you're going to keep going. But that's the reality that's, uh, that's, that's facing each one of us in the face. The need for God to intervene, the need for God to send us his son who became what? Who became a human, who was born of a virgin, sinless. Can you imagine the Son of God coming down from heaven into a mother's womb? And my daughter-in-law, while I'm thinking about it, and Sebi, my son, they just had a baby. She was in the hospital. What, a week, seven days? <laughs> seven days. By the way, his name is Ransom. And he held them ransom for seven days, and then he finally came. And we, he's doing good, and the mother's doing good. But see, that is what God gave us. God the Son came. He was born of a virgin. He came through the birth canal, was born. He was circumcised. He did everything he was supposed to. He fulfilled all the righteous requirements and all the laws that God had said on humanity at the, from the very beginning, he fulfilled everything perfectly. He was without sin and fulfilled all the righteousness of God perfectly. That is how we get into heaven, through his righteousness. See, what does that do when you hear that? That it took God, the Son, to become human, to be born, to walk this earth, to suffer the way he did on the cross? What does that do to us? Well, it humbles us. It humbles us because that's what it took for you to be saved. That's what it took for us to be saved, to be ransomed. It humbles us because this is an alien righteousness. It's not a righteousness that was in us. It was a righteousness that came from outside of us, given to us. And we gave him our sins. It humbles us because not everyone believes in Christ. And they are still being held captive. They will not be released. This is why there needs to be. There is a need for everyone to hear the gospel message. See, that puts the burden back on and it, it, it's God, but it's his church. God uses the people of his church. Macy, Mary, Enrique, and all of us who are part of his church. He uses us as messengers of the gospel, a, the means through which people will be saved. Through your lips, by sharing the gospel message, people will hear it people that are right to hear it, people that the Spirit is already working on, they'll hear it, they'll go, Man, what did you say? And I've been trying all my life to figure this out. And every time I get close, something else happens. I've been trying all my life to understand. I've been missing this all my life. I've been longing for a love that wouldn't disappoint me. And it is Him. It is Christ. That's why you are needed to share the gospel message. Everyone needs to hear it. Everyone who has been taken captive, 
needs to hear the message. That's why Psalm 49, 15 tells us that God is the one who will ransom our soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. He will receive us. See, it is only God who can ransom us. That's what it's telling us. It's only God who can do it. Can you imagine the Jews of the Old Testament? They're going like, what? Okay, God's going to do it, but like, how? This is pre-Christ. This is pre the Son of God coming to the earth. We see why. We see how it's all working, how it all works together. And remember that Sheo, Sheo is the darkness on the other side of death, eternal darkness. It was the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity himself, the God-man, Jesus Christ, who has ransomed us, who has paid this king's ransom he, by, give, by, by laying down his life on the cross. That is, again, that is something that we hear all the time, but we, especially during this time of Lent, we cannot take that lightly. What it meant for our Lord, who felt pain and sorrow, to lay his life down, get beaten to one inch of his life, and then to be crucified for your sake, for our sake, because he loves us, to ransom us. We cannot overlook this. He ransoms us. He makes atonement for our sins. That is a king's ransom. But now that brings us to the next question, and we'll go through it quick. To whom is this king's ransom paid? To whom is this king's ransom paid? Now, the early church fathers, uh, uh, people like, like uh, Origen uh, of, of Alexandria, uh, believed that, that Jesus paid a ransom to Satan. They believe that the ransom was paid to Satan. And, and that's understandable because there are some texts, there are some verses in Holy Scripture that tell us that, that, that the sinners are being held captive by the devil. But obviously, that is not true. Jesus could not pay a ransom to Satan because that would mean that a creature could demand something from, a cre from the Creator. A creature, Satan is a creature who is created, and a creature cannot make a demand upon the creator. So the ransom is not being paid, is not being made to Satan. And that becomes obvious with Jesus. Remember the story of the parable that Jesus says about the strong man? The strong man? Jesus tells a parable about the strong man who is Satan. And the plunder, the goods that, that, this, that belong to the strong man, guess who the goods are? We're the plunder. We are the, the goods that, that are in this house. They're housed. And be, this, this place is being ruled by this strong man. Jesus says this about this strong man. He says, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first, what? binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus, our Lord, binds Satan. He binds Satan, and then he gets to the plunder. He gets to the, to the goods that were in this house that was ruled by Satan. The, 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 the goods of the, the, who are, we're the plunder. We're the ones that the, the, the evil one was whispering to and telling us not to believe the gospel and telling us there's other ways to heaven when Jesus himself tells us that he is the only way. Jesus binds a strong man and gets the plunder. He releases us from captivity. He releases us. From captivity, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ binds a strong man and takes possession of the plunder by paying the ransom owed. So who does the who does Christ pay the ransom to? Not to Satan. He binds Satan. He pays the ransom to God Himself. He pays the ransom to God. When we sin, we commit a crime against God. We commit an eternal crime against God because he is eternal God. 
our Lord God Almighty, who is righteous, when he sees us, when he, we stand before him, is a righteous God, is a righteous judge who will give, a, give us a perfect judgment. We stand before God. He is there. He looks at us and he says, Manny, I don't know how many, I quit counting how many sins you did. I am God. I am perfectly righteous. I cannot go against my righteousness. I have to decree to you that you are guilty as charged that you are condemned to eternal damnation. That is what a righteous God would do. But then he says, someone paid your ransom. Someone paid the price of your captivity. Someone paid the price for you. And that is my son, that God the Son, Jesus himself pays the price. That's how it works. We, he, we give him our sin. He gives us his righteousness. When we sin, we commit an eternal debt to God and, God, and Christ pays that debt that we owe to God. When Scripture talks about the atonement, it emphasizes God's demand. The Lord orders the suffering servant to be crushed for our iniquity. In Isaiah, the, the a prophet Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, and it pleased them to see God, Christ, crushed. Pleased him. Because all along, God knew, Christ knew what was taking place. We didn't. We didn't understand it. Those at the cross did not understand what was going on. It was beyond their comprehension. Moreover, Satan could not have taken us hostage in the first place. He could not have taken us captive in the first place without God's div divine permission. Therefore, if anyone could demand a ransom for our salvation, it has to be God. So it is God who paid the price to God, to himself, to ransom us. That is who the ransom is paid for. So why is the ransom paid for? Now that's a tough question. Why is the ransom paid for? Well, it's paid for you and me, for those of us who believe in Christ. But why? Why? When God first saved me, and I was in my adulthood, I was 30-something. 30, 30 that's the question I couldn't understand. I, I couldn't understand why he saved me. I couldn't understand why he saved somebody who cursed him who turned and ran from him, who knew that he was committing sin and committed it anyway. Didn't matter. Why did God, why did Christ ransom us? Why? 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 Here it comes. Because he loves us. Because he loves us. That's hard, though. It's hard to understand because why does he love you? There's nothing in you, nothing in me, that would make him say that. And not only that, why doesn't he save everybody? And it is clear in Scripture that he does not save everybody. Doesn't that humble you? Doesn't that just kind of give you that feeling like, I don't deserve this. I can only submit to it. I can only receive it. I can only receive you, Lord. I can only receive this gift. I can't pay for it. We'll never be able to pay for it. All I can do is submit and give my life to you, to you, God, to serve you, not just on this side of glory, but for all eternity. That is what you're called to do. You're called to submit and be obedient to him, not to be saved. You're already saved, but because you are saved, you are called to submit to God. So what do you need to hear? What do you need to hear? What's the big question? Well, here's the big question for all of us. Is there ransom due on your life? Is there ransom due on your life? If you oh, if there is, then you're not saved yet. If you're saved, there is no ransom, any more ransom due. It's been paid for. Let me finish the story about those, uh, those, those people taken captive in, in Haiti. They escaped. All of them escaped. They're captors, just like we escape. 
from the condemnation of hell through the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. By him, we have been ransomed. That is what's wonderful. That is what's going on. Just like Mary and Macy and, and Enrique, you can make a reaffirmation of faith all the time. That's okay. It's a reminder saying it is all about him. It is all about him. In fact, when I interviewed Mary and Macy, I said, after the interview, I said, if you heard, because we talked about different things, like what those questions meant, and I said, if you, if you remember anything about this interview, remember it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It is all about him. It's all about him. It's not about denomination. It's not about religion. It is about him. He is why you live, and you live for his glory. Let us pray together. You've been listening to Manny Alanese, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel. For more information about our church, visit our website at ststephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. Please join us prayerfully and financially as we seek to glorify God by preaching His Word and spreading the gospel of grace in boldness and selflessness.